Hi everybody and welcome to a new episode of Diagnose Dan. Today we're working on a 2011 BMW X6. <laughs> X6. And the customer comes... <laughs> Hi everybody and welcome to a new episode of Diagnose Dan. Today we're working on a 2011 BMW X6. The customer complaint is there's a picture of a shock absorber being displayed on the dash. He also can no longer control the sport setting of his suspension. So let's diagnose this together. Let's start out by confirming the customer complaint. Customer complaint confirmed. So let's bring out the scan tool and see if there are any fault codes stored within the VDC system that can help us diagnose our problem. Now let's go to Vertical Dynamics Management or VDM and let's read the codes. And there is a code stored, message, status damper satellite rear left, which basically means that the VDM control unit is not able to communicate with the rear left damper control unit. Now over here we've got our four damper satellites or damper control units front left front right rear left and rear right the VDM control unit is telling us it's unable to communicate with the rear left damper satellite so let's try it with the scan tool and indeed no communication now let's try another one let's try the front right and no problem. Now before we start diagnosing this BMW's damping system, first let's get to know the system a little bit better. Starting off by the basic operation of shock absorbers or dampers. The function of the damper is to make sure the wheel doesn't lose contact with the road and follows the imperfections. At the same time, it's trying to keep the body steady. Too soft of a damper and you will get a floaty ride. Too hard of a damper and the ride will become very bumpy. Now if we want to learn more about dampers we've got to start with the basics and the most basic damper of them all is the oil filled monotube shock absorber. Now it's called a monotube oil filled damper because basically it's just a single tube completely filled with oil. As the piston moves up and down through the oil, the oil can flow from one side of the piston to the other side through small passages. Now the piston moving up and down through the oil creates resistance. The resistance is resulting in the damping force of our shock absorber. 
Now the oil-filled shock absorber has got a very big disadvantage. Let me explain. As the piston moves up and down through the oil, the oil has got to rush from one side to the other side of the piston through these narrow passages. The speed of the oil increases as it's passing these narrow passages. The increase of the speed results in a venturi effect, creating a pressure drop within the oil. The pressure drop in the oil because of the venturi effect results in cavitation. And cavitation allows air bubbles to form in our oil. Now the last thing we want is air bubbles mixing with our hydraulic fluid. Air can be compressed as our oil cannot be. So as air bubbles start mixing with our hydraulic fluid, we get a drastic loss in performance. Now we obviously don't want to lose performance. So let's take a look at the gas-filled monotube shock absorber. To avoid cavitation or the forming of air in our hydraulic fluid, a gas-filled damper has got an extra chamber. This chamber is filled with pressurized gas. In between the pressurized gas and the oil is a free-moving or free-floating piston, making sure there's always equal pressure underneath and above the piston. This way, the oil is always pressurized, avoiding cavitation. So a gas-filled damper doesn't mean the entire damper is filled with gas. Every damper works on the principle of a piston moving through a hydraulic fluid. These are two dampers that can be fitted under exactly the same car. One of them is gas filled and the other one is oil filled. Right away we can see that the piston of the gas filled damper is being secured to make it fit the box it came in. If you want to identify if your damper is oil filled or gas filled, just push down on the piston. If you push it down and it doesn't move, the damper is oil filled. Now let's try the same with our gas filled damper. A monotube gas filled damper isn't perfect either. Just take a look at the piston rod. It's quite large and it makes up quite a big volume. Now as we lower this volume into the cylinder, it takes up volume where used to be oil and that oil has got nowhere to go. So let's take a look at a twin tube damper. A twin tube damper has got an inner tube or working cylinder and an outer tube which is a reservoir. Now as the piston comes down into the cylinder it takes up volume. Volume where there used to be oil. That oil needs to go somewhere and it can escape through this valve in the bottom of the cylinder into the reservoir. Now the oil in the reservoir is pressurized by gas. As the piston moves up and down into the cylinder, the oil level also goes up and down in the opposite direction in the reservoir.
Each damper is made for a specific car. This damper has got a fixed damping force. The resistance of the piston is always the same. It's determined by the resistance of the valves we use. In other words, how hard or how easy it is for the oil to flow through the valves. Now wouldn't it be great if there was a damper that could change your suspension from comfort to sport with only one touch of a button. This is what BMW calls a VDM damper. VDM stands for Vertical Dynamics Management. But lots of other brands call this system CDC or Continuous Damping Control. A CDC damper is basically a twin tube damper with an extra bypass controlled by an electric valve. When the valve is opened it allows oil to bypass these valves over here and flow directly from the reservoir into the cylinder and vice versa. As this electric valve is closed oil is not allowed to flow through the bypass and this CDC damper will behave as any other normal twin tube damper. Now in case of a malfunction there's no power going to the valve and it will sit in its rest position which is closed. Now as the piston moves down into the cylinder and the valve is energized oil is allowed to flow through the bypass. Now as the piston comes down oil no longer needs to flow through these restriction valves in the piston. It can flow directly from the reservoir to the top of the piston resulting in lower resistance. Now if the bypass is opened when the piston moves up oil can flow directly from the top of the piston to the reservoir resulting in lower resistance when the piston moves up. Now we've got a damper of which we can control the damping forces. If we do decycle the control valve we can open the valve for 10, 15, 20, 35, 80 percent of the time whatever we want. The possibilities are limitless. Now each damper has got its own control unit and the control unit is in control of the CDC valve. Now inside the control unit there's a vertical acceleration sensor and when it hits a bump it can very swiftly react by altering the resistance of the damper and make sure that the wheel follows the road. Each damper has got its own control module and every control module has got its own power and ground. This control module is communicating to the main VDM control module by two flex ray wires. In this case the main VDM control module is located in the trunk of our car. The main VDM control unit is connected to a lot more sensors. For instance, the ride height sensors. These can detect when the car is in a corner. And the system can stop the car from rolling by altering the stiffness of each individual damper. The system can also detect if the car is braking. Now normally when a car brakes, it nose dives. The system can detect this and stop this from happening by altering the resistance of the dampers. Hmm. Now so far you guys have only seen my fantastic drawings. But I took my grinder and opened up the real thing. So let's take a look to the outside and the inside of our damper. 
This is a CDC damper, which consists out of a twin tube shock absorber, a control module with internal sensors and full diagnostic capabilities, and a control valve. Now, as you can see, this damper is made out of two tubes, an outer tube, which holds the reservoir, and an inner tube, which is the working cylinder with our piston inside. We can move the piston up and down in the cylinder. In normal operation, oil can flow through the valves in the piston to the other side or through the bottom valve into the reservoir. As I cut away the cylinder wall, we can see the cylinder wall is actually double. In the first cylinder wall, there's a hole. In between the first and the second cylinder wall, there's a passage leading all the way to our control valve. If the valve is opened, oil can flow through the passage in the cylinder wall through the valve into the reservoir. Now this is where the oil enters the valve and this is where the oil comes out of the valve into the reservoir. So the VDM control unit, which is the main control unit for this system and which is communicating with all four damper satellites, has lost communication with the rear left. Time to take a closer look and to bring out a wiring diagram. This is the damper satellite rear left or the rear left damper control unit and it gets its power from this red and gray wire on pin 1 from fuse 106. Now the ground is provided on pin 2 by this brown wire. This purple wire over here and the green wire over here are the flex ray high and the flex ray low communication wires which communicate to the VDM control unit. Now this is our rear left damper and this is our damper control unit or satellite which we can not communicate with. This is the damper control valve and in between the mud guard and the heat shield over here, there's a holder holding the connectors of our damper. Now the first thing we're going to do is check the power and ground with a test light on pins 1 and 2 and if that's okay, we're going to check the flex rate communication on this green and pink wire using a scope. Let's back probe the power and the ground on pin 1 and pin 2. And if the power and the ground are okay, my test light should light up. And it does. Confirming the power and ground are not our problem. I've back probed the green and the pink communication wires 
and hook them up to a scope. But there seems to be nothing wrong with our flex ray communication. We've checked the power and we've checked the ground. We checked both communication wires and everything seems to be fine. But our satellite won't communicate. The problem seems to be internal to the satellite itself. Unfortunately, the satellite isn't a serviceable item and we need to replace the entire rear left damper assembly. As we get in the trunk, there are three plastic clips and when we get them out, we can pull the carpet aside and underneath there are three nuts we need to undo. The next thing I'm going to do is to support the car so it won't go up or down while I'm getting the damper out. After you supported the vehicle, undo the wiring Get this clip out, holding the brake hose down, remove the brake hose from the holder and finally undo this bolt and gently lower the damper. The new damper doesn't come with this sleeve or this upper support, so we need to reuse the old one. After this, we can reinstall the damper. I've got the new damper installed, so let's see if our communication has been restored.
Let's select chassis. And let's select the rear left damper satellite. And communication is back. Let's read the fault codes. And there is a code stored. Control unit not coded or implausible data. Now as you could see, there was a fault code stored in the new satellite telling us it needed coding. Now that's correct because we still need to code the new control unit. Now if you're having trouble understanding the differences between coding and programming, keep watching my channel because I will make future videos on that topic. Now the first thing I did is scan the car for software updates. Now the initial report says no control units need updating. This means that all control units in this car, including the new satellite that came from the factory, already have the latest software installed. Now we do need to code the new satellite though, so let's continue with coding. And let's select the control unit. And let's see if we can find the rear left damper satellite. And here it is, damper satellite, rear left. Now you can see it already has the latest software programmed. So the only thing we need to do is code it. Now we're almost done, we diagnosed the car, we installed the new damper, we checked for software updates, we coded the control unit, but there's one more thing we need to do. Remember I told you that inside the satellite there's a sensor that registers the vertical acceleration. That sensor needs to be calibrated. Let's go to chassis. Let's select the rear left damper satellite and let's go to surface functions and let's do a vertical acceleration sensor adjustment. Now it tells you to park the vehicle horizontally on a flat and even ground, which I did, and turn the ignition on. It also tells us that this surface function will carry out an adjustment of all four satellite vertical acceleration sensors. Now I scanned the car and there are no more fault codes stored. There's one last thing we need to do and that's to confirm the fix. A twin tube damper was designed to function in an upright position. But most of the time they are stored on their side. Making it possible for the gas and oil to mix. When you get the new damper out of the box, 
it can appear to be defective, but this is not the case. To get rid of this problem and get the gas back in the top of the reservoir, just cycle the piston three times before you fit the damper on the car. Just make sure the damper is in an upright position and cycle it once. Twice. three times.